Good evening, everyone. Um, I see that people are still coming into the room, but we have so much to go through tonight, so much fun stuff that I think we, we ought to get started. So welcome to the Food and Ideas Festival. Um, this is the third of our China Institute programs look this year, looking at, at China through food. And today we're gonna to talk about the artisanal farm movement um, that's sweeping the Chinese food world. Um, the farm to table movement, focusing on ingredients and process. Uh, and, and then we're gonna zoom to Taiwan and meet the guy who's making what some people say is the best soy sauce in the world. Um, so let me just first make some introductions and then I'm gonna call all the speakers onto the stage. Um, we're gonna start out this evening with Mara King who is a native of Hong Kong and a bona fide foodie. Uh, an expert in fermentation, which I've just learned is fa xiao in Chinese. Um, Mara produced a fabulous series of short films on Southwestern Chinese fermentation practices. And she's now working on a book on Chinese fermentation, as well as the second series of her People's Republic of Fermentation um, films that will focus on Taiwan and China's Eastern provinces. Mara is going to tell us about Sichuan and Yunnan tonight and a little bit about Hong Kong as well. Um, we also have Lisa Chung-Smith, who is founder of Yunhai Taiwanese Pantry. Lisa became fascinated with ingredients and found some incredible artisanal producers in Taiwan, where the farm to table movement and obsession with roots and nature is flourishing. Uh, and so Lisa is gonna share with us what she has found there. And finally, um, Ozzy Xie, who who is also known as Xie Yichang, is a third generation producer of soy sauce, the soy sauce called Yu Ding Xing. And we're gonna have a chat with him about how it's made and what makes it so special and what the Taiwan market looks like. Um, Ozzy is also the founder and chef of something called the Future Dining Table, which is a series of food events that connect farmers to consumers and experts and also speaks to the rise of this farm to table movement that has been sweeping Taiwan as well. So um, why don't you all come on the screen with me now and join me and we'll get started. Um, so wonderful, welcome everybody. Hi Lisa, hi Mara, hi Ozzy. And we also have Ben Yi who will join us at the end to help with translation if we need it. But um, so let's start out with Mara. Uh, we've got so much to move through, but so, so Mara, since we're talking tonight about a growing interest in connecting with traditions, um, let's start with you about, firstly, how you personally were deeply connected from an early age to food and the production of food. Tell us about the noodle factory. Um, so I grew up in Hong Kong. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mara. I grew up in Hong Kong. Um, uh, my, I am a mixed race child of Hong Kong. My father was from the, um, New York, uh, Connecticut sort of border area. And then my mom was a first generation born Hong Kong Chinese. Um, and my grandfather started a noodle company in 1941. Um, and, uh, you know, all of my, my, my mom is one of nine brothers and sisters and all of my uncles and aunties um, all at one point or another worked in the noodle factory. And also, you know, I think there were various different restaurants that were um, attached to the noodle factory. Um, that was that was based in, in Mong Kok in Hong yeah. Kong, yeah. Uh, one of the most densely populated spots on the planet. Um, and uh, yeah, from there, he, you know, the noodle factory expanded to, to Honolulu at one point, that branch was sold, um, but actually only just, uh, a year and a half ago, um, my uncle sold the noodle business. Um, right. It still exists. It's still, it's just, but it's still in operation, yes. That's so cool. Okay, so and years later, you got heavily into fermentation. And, um, and then you journeyed to China as part of your research and, and you know, part of the process to learn about traditional fermentation methods there. So tell us a little bit about what you found. Let's, let's start, I think we're gonna start in Sichuan and we have some wonderful um, images we can share with everyone. Um, so who, who is this? What did you find here? This is Chef Zhang and he, he was um, an amazing chef and he was operating an ecotourism spot. So there has been a trend in recent years of um, P2 
people who live in the cities um, taking sort of local vacations or vacations in the countryside to go and have sort of an experience of fresh air as well as to experience, um, you know, where food comes from and like in a farm to table type setting. And yeah. when we when we visited with um, Chef Zhang, he took us on a hike up that mountain that you see behind his little um, his little farm plot. We picked some veggies out of his plot as well. Yeah. Um, and on the mountainside, we picked lots of different fresh herbs and um uh, we picked some fresh bamboo shoots, and then when we came back to his um, his home, which was his family's home, uh, we slaughtered a chicken together, and um, we he he prepared an amazing um, meal from the veggies that we had picked um, and food from his own allotment. It's so fantastic, and I love the idea that um, I mean it's just fascinating that you now have urban dwellers who are kind of longing to go back to this. His, his, I urge people to watch the video because the People's Republic of Fermentation is a wonderful series and you can see them hiking through the mountains and picking bamboo shoots, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but, but it's it's so charming and it's it's not like it's particularly gussied up. I mean, this is real, real time. It's not gussied up for tourists, right? This is the real no. deal. No, this is, um, and it was a great example of like home style cooking. Um, and what's not shown, like there was fresh tofu waiting for us as soon as we showed up. They had, um, they had ground soybeans and cooked fresh tofu. Um, so we had lunch and then hiked and killed a chicken and then had dinner. Um, and he displayed amazing skills as a chef as well. He was um, deft and capable in the kitchen and I found out he had been working for large restaurants um, in Sichuan before going sort of on this own you know starting his own business from his family home. And do you think his business is doing pretty well? I think it's doing really great. That's fantastic that's so cool okay so let's move on because I know now we've got some Dobanjiang so this is just an, an amazing photograph. <laughs> yeah Tell so this is in Pixian which is a region outside of um, Chengdu which is very famous for Dobanjiang and this was a state which sponsored. Is, is, I guess we should jump in and say what that is I guess it's it's bean paste right spicy chili. Dobanjiang is a chili bean paste. So, you know, what Dobanjiang is in Sichuan and what Dobanjiang is in Hong Kong and what Dobanjiang is in Taiwan are all very different things. So it's a very regional thing. Um, the Sichuanese version of Dobanjiang is very, very famous um, and it features uh, broad beans or fava beans um, and chilies. But many versions of Dobanjiang will have different kinds of beans, like will feature soybeans, some will have chilies, some will not. Okay, yeah, so let's look at the next next slide. Um, and then these are, yeah, these are the long vats. So think of, think of this scene that you see in front of you and expand it by, you know, 50 times. I think you could have fit three soccer fields inside that main fermentation space. And the reason the space is so large is that their basic fermentation is a two year process. Okay. Um, the beans and the chilies ferment for one year, separate from one another. And then they're blended in these large vats um, by massive machines. Um, mm -hmm. in, and then they ferment for another year. And every single day, um, the, uh, the vats are stirred. Okay. Um, this is on the rooftop where they had a smaller artisanal version of what was going on below in the, in the massive vats. So this is more of a traditional method. And in this small artisanal zone, they were making up to seven year old Dobanjangs. Wow. And again, even, even these pots up on the ceiling or on the, on the rooftop were opened every day to, um, to the air and to the sunshine, which is an important part of the process, open to the humidity, which is an important part of the process. And then they were stirred every single day and then flattened out every single day. Okay, got it. Yeah. So next, next slide here. I love this guy. Okay, so tell us about him. This is Chef Guan, and he runs the restaurant that is attached to the, um, the factory. It's called the Red Star Pixian Restaurant. 
and it's a massive, also a massive affair. He boasted that he could serve 6,000 guests in one day, which literally just blew my mind. I couldn't even imagine what wow. serving 6,000 people in one day even looks like. Um, and I don't know how true that is, but I thought it was a pretty impressive claim. And as you can see, his dishes were very opposite to the farm to table type dishes that we saw. These are very elaborate and ex exquisite dishes. Um, and that Chef Guan in the previous picture was showing his famous dish was the Toto fish, which is um, like a Sichuan style dish that features the Dobanjiang um, from the factory. Right, right, right. And uh, famous, like famous Sichuan mala style dish. Yeah. And his restaurant's kind of an homage to Doban Jiang, I guess. <laughs> so this is fantastic. This Let's is the pickling. Nice. This is the pickling outfit that was connected to the restaurant. Now so I guess this is this the 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 um scale at which one needs to be able to pickle in order to serve six thousand people in your restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, and there's yeah, as you can see, many different jars and many different kinds of ferments. Um, some very like Sichuanese style, regional style ferments going on in the, in those big I jars. In the video, he was looking for the long beans and couldn't he find them. He was looking for the long beans and he literally <laughs> opened like 50, 50 different jars to find those long beans. It's so fantastic. Okay, so let's jump over to Yunnan now. Here we go. This is so charming. What is this? Yeah, so this is Tushang Shiguan. And this is um, a small farm to table restaurant in Kunming in Yunnan. Um, run by a woman entrepreneur called Li Fen. And, um, you know, she started, I think she was way ahead of the curve in terms of starting a farm to table restaurant in China um, and um, started in, you know, in league with um, the, the members of her, you know, her father and mother's friends in the villages um, to grow food specifically and, and animals specifically for the restaurants. This is a picture of Li Fen. I couldn't actually find a very clear photo of her, but this is a screenshot. It's very film. sweet, but, but Tu Fen Shi Guan basically means kind of from the earth. The restaurant is yes. called, right? Something like sort of from the earth restaurant. Yes. Uh, yeah, grown of the earth, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, in front of the restaurant, here's, you know, pictures of the people from the restaurant or people who are growing for them. And she told a very charming story that um, she it took some it took some um, convincing for her to try and get people to not use pesticides and oh. herbicides when they were growing for them. Um, you know, the, the farmers would say, well, but then you'll just get vegetables that have bite marks in them or they don't look perfect and are you sure these are the vegetables that you want and you know when she finally convinced them it was actually a very um no nonsense return to organic practices um many of oh this one's hard to see but it says let's bow in gratitude to land nature and farmers Love um, that. and that was it that's on the interior of the restaurant um she yeah. How did she she said that family? a lot of uh, she said a lot of the elders in the village, like the grandmas and grandpas, remembered how to do the organic practices because this was basically the their practices before some more modern um, techniques became available. So to switch back to organic was easy. And this these are some pictures from a meal that we made together um, using some of the fermented ingredients at the end of our travels. Um, there's some Yunnanese cheese featured here. There's dobanjang featured here. There's uh, um, uh, the Yuan soy sauce um, that I that I collected in Hong Kong is featured here. So we collected a bunch of fermented ingredients, and at the very end of our our trip, we cooked together um, as a group. And again, it's sort of not especially gussied up for tourists. So, and I guess that's kind of the point, right? Is that that city slickers they want to have something that feels like the real deal in the countryside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So beautiful. It's just so beautiful. I love that photograph. Um, so that's so great. So so I, I just want to sort of put this in a broader context too, because there is this fascinating new kind of next gen um, fascination in China with traditions and going back to roots, right? So, you know, we know that we've got these two incredibly famous super vloggers 
Um, we've got a couple of pictures of them. So this is Lisa Chi, who will tell, she's got a whole series of videos, right? So she's sort of like the Martha Stewart of- Yeah, she's become, of, yeah, she became a star on, um, you know, China's version of, of YouTube and then has since started sharing her videos um, with a broader audience and more international audience and has received, um, you know, a lot of um, attention from all over the world. Uh, her videos are very, um, very high production value, but very low in terms of like talking and information. It's just pictures of her running around doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and her knowledge base and her ability is just really quite stunning. She has yeah. quite an amazing story as well. She was a DJ um, in, really? yeah, she was a DJ in a big city and sort of um, had to go back to the village because her grandma was getting was getting older and was in poor health, and um, she went home to take care of her grandma. Um, and her grandma is featured often in the videos as well. And um, I feel like the popularity of her videos and Dian Shi Xiaogu, who's um, a, a Yunnan-based um, vlogger. Um, I think the popularity of both of these women, young women is really indicative of um, people very having very much a yearning for traditional methods and, and means. And, um, you know, I find them to be extremely inspiring because, you know, in my own visit to China, I could see when I went to the small villages that, um, you know, there's a real lack of young people um, yeah. in the villages. It's, you know, it, you go to the small villages and it's elders and children and anybody who's of age to work, they're off in the cities working in factories and, you know, doing doing other kinds of jobs to support their families. And, you know, the traditional knowledge is vast and it really takes a lifetime, I feel like, to learn this kind of knowledge because it's practice based. Mm -hmm. So um, it just was really heartening for me to see young people in the villages practicing and learning and sharing their knowledge um, and then also getting, um, you know, recognition and um, financial payback for that. Right, right. Exactly. So the villagers can now have new respect for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and sort of pride in what they do. Um, OK, so let's take a look now. The next couple of photographs are of this Hong Kong. Yeah, so these, these are from a soy sauce factory in Yunlong in Hong Kong. Um, it was a rainy day. You can see the shiny pots were all covered. Um, and this was uh, from Yun Soy Sauce, was a, a business that was founded by a woman in 1974. She's since passed, wow. um, but the business continues to this day. And Yuan Soy Sauce prides itself on being the most expensive soy sauce in Hong Kong. It's sold at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel and at, um, at City Super in, in Hong Kong, um, which is a very posh um, uh, grocery chain. And these little 125 milliliter bottles sell for 20 US dollars each. Wow. And they also have a they also have a two year minimum fermentation time on the uh, soy sauce. It's fermented from whole beans um, and is very much sort of a, a hands-on preparation. Their woks that they that they boil the soybeans in are also um, wood fired. Um, so uh -huh. the same method that UN has been making making soy sauce using the same methods for um, over forty years. Fantastic. Wow. So that's a little glimpse of what we're going to see in a few minutes when we hop over to Taiwan. But let's thank you so much, Mary. That was just so fascinating. Fabulous. What a wonderful kind of um, race through southwestern China. <laughs> but um, so, Lisa, let's bring you on now and talk about, um, you know, what you discovered in Taiwan. I mean, you, uh, you know, became fascinated by ingredients, right? And you went traveling to Taiwan and found this wonderful, wonderful food. So tell us, tell us that story. Whoops, you're mute, you're muted. So unmute yourself. Classic, classic. No worries, uh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll try to summarize the story. Um, Essentially, so my mom was from Taiwan and I um, 
had been going with her since I was young and, you know, was very engaged in that culture, but in sort of the mass aspects of that culture. So like, you know, night markets in the middle of the city and like bigger box hotels and like that kind of thing. And then coming home, I, in my twenties, I got very interested in cooking Chinese and Taiwanese food. Um, and that also was like, okay, I'm going to go to the, you know, the Chinese grocery store and try to find these brands that like my saw that were in my pantry when I was a kid. Anyway, I kept going to Taiwan, just, you know, went there on my honeymoon, uh, went there for work a few times and just kind of kept opening up into what Taiwan had to offer mm -hmm. and essentially started just going like completely away from cities and being like, okay, like what is here in this town? And just okay. kind of came to know like a number of different people like, um, you know, tea farmers who introduced me to a lot of different kinds of uh, food that was like made in the village. Um, and then my aunt actually, uh, so my first product was this, I don't know if you can see this, Sue Chili yeah. Crisp. Yeah. Empty bottle. If you find a full bottle of Sue Chili Crisp anywhere, something's wrong. <laughs> Uh-oh, you're frozen, Lisa. Um, hopefully the Wi-Fi will come back. Oh, gosh. Let's give her a second and hopefully she'll come back. And if not, then we might have to jump over to Taiwan and talk to Ozzy. Um, let me just type a message to her. Well, you know what? I think we're gonna to have to jump over to Taiwan and let's talk to Ozzy first then and we'll come back to hear Lisa's story afterwards. Um, so Ozzy, you wanna come join us on, on the screen? Um, unmute yourself. And oh, hey, Ozzy, welcome. Hey. Uh, um, so, Ozzie, you are the third generation yeah. of a family business yes. and the company is called Yu Ding Xing, right? And yes. uh, you're making soy sauce. Uh, yeah. So tell us, you know, firstly, what makes your soy sauce so special? Why, you know, some people say it's the best soy sauce in the world. So why is it so special? Um, I think it's the, the, the first, the, the most important thing. I, I would say the, the, the ingredient that we use is different. We okay. use uh, black soybean instead of soy. So the flavor and how it used is totally different. Um, uh, I, I would say the, 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 the ingredient and also how we made it, it also, it's also a very uh, a big uh, difference as well. Uh, we use a very traditional methods to, to, to uh, brew our uh, black soybean. So um, we, we, we use the traditional uh, wood firing method as well. So uh, later on, you will see how we do it and you will see the uh, traditional stove. Uh, we are, uh, right now we are, uh, do, we, we are wood firing as well. Okay, and, yep. yeah. So, so um, firstly, Lisa, we'll come back to you. Okay, and okay no problem. You know, since you're both talking about the trend in Taiwan, you know, you can both maybe join in the conversation. But first, Ozzy, a few more questions for you. I'm really curious about the market in Taiwan for your, you're like your soy sauce is very expensive, right? It's 30, 20 US dollars, 30 US dollars? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so is there a good market for it? And is there is there a kind of a trend, which is people want to go back to this artisanal, homemade food um i would say for the past couple of years we we it, it happens that we had the uh a food uh, some kind of food crisis and so that at that time people start to raise their uh, their, uh the, how important the the food it is so yeah. they when when they are purchasing they will start mm -hmm. to look at the 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 label so they will be able to know what's inside Right. And I think that is the, the, the starting point. Uh, the people start to recognize the quality instead of price. Right. Okay. And the food crisis, just to explain for our audience, I think you mean there was kind of a scandal where some bad food was being st yes. sold, dangerous yeah. ingredients or something. And, yeah. The uh, big yeah. Company, they, even they, they have really nice uh, brand, 
and uh, all the uh, all, all, all the tests, um, but they use the really uh, bad uh, ingredients, and yeah. even though endanger our health. So um, right. once once it break out, um, people start to. I, I think a lot of people panic. Yeah. But so what we can do is we we, we will just let them know. Um, there is still a really nice quality food uh, on the market. Yep, yep. So, you know, you just saw that in mainland China, they have like Dian Xi Xiao Ge and they have um, Li Zi Qi. It's become a very um, fashionable to, yeah. you know, go back to traditions and to have beautiful organic um, ingredients. Do you see a kind of a similar thing happening in Taiwan? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, people, because before, before that, we, we don't, we, before, before we just, um, before we, we, we let people to getting to know the new labels, um, people don't know what soy sauce is made. Right. So what we what we do now is we we post our daily basics the the the, the work pictures online and then share what we are doing, so yeah. people will, would have a better understanding how uh, all the process and how long it takes for a bath of soy sauce is made. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. People would people would, would appreciate uh, the 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 efforts. Yeah. How long yeah, does it take to make your soy sauce? How long does it take? So, um, for in Taiwan, especially in Xiluo, it takes at least the the, the minimum at, at least six months. But we also have one year, one year and a half, and three year as well. Okay, okay. So you know what I think. So Lisa, do you think you're back? Is your Wi-Fi working now? What do you think? Tell me. Can you see me? Hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So let's so let's try since you're both talking about you know kind of similar things, and you can help us understand or think a little more broadly what's happening in Taiwan, um, in terms of kind of the market trends and that kind of thing. So should we take a look at you know we have some beautiful slides also of this fantastic market Maji, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I think maybe let me just give like a finish up my. Quick sure. intro. So I think that the long and short. So I run Yunhai uh, Taiwanese Pantry, and we sell yep. basically high end ingredients from Taiwan. And I think that for me, um, you know, the long and short of it is that these like top shelf kind of artisanal small batch products from Taiwan and China are not sold here, but they've existed yep. for many years. Like this is actually yes, people in Taiwan are returning to their roots, and in China they're returning to their roots. But like. Ozzy's Brewery is three generations old and it's been running the whole time. And there's many, many, many other small places that have been doing this. And yeah. like you liken it to like maybe like olive oil or olive oil or balsamic vinegar production or whatever. But we're so used to seeing, at least in the States, these like Northern European top shelf foods. So when I started, people were like, you can't sell a bottle of soy sauce for $20 unless it's Japanese, which I'm like, well, I think I can, no one's just ever done it yet because this product has been represented here. So for me, I'm functioning as like a connective yeah. uh, connector basically to say like, well, yeah. what are all these products? Like the reason people don't know about them or want them is because um, th they haven't been exposed to them. And so yeah. that's kind of the role of the distributor, right? Is to like yeah. kind of make things available and provide access. So that's what I'm doing. and. Um, yeah, we can go to Maji now if, if you want, but like basically in Taiwan, there's just like endless, endless products and producers to work with. And I'm really hoping to work with all of them. Amazing, how great. And actually just to sort of connect this as well to what's happening in the Chinese food world in the States, at least in New York, and I think probably in other restaurants as well, is there also at restaurants here, there is a kind of a drive to you know, a bunch of restaurants are now making their own chili crisp and they're making their own hoisin sauce and that kind of thing. There is, there is, you know, this kind of movement is sweeping across the Chinese food world in America too, I think, you know, this, the sense of an interest in, an interest in, uh, you know, the sort of origins of what we're eating and the- Yeah, so, yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that there is this kind of like, it's been described in New York as like this Chinese food re uh, renaissance where, 
there have been like many, many ways of amazing Chinese food, but now there's like all these different like hyper regional cuisines. Yeah. Um, and that's so great. And you have like Mr. Jews in San Francisco winning like accolades, best restaurant, da, da, da. but for home cooks who are not in San Francisco, New York or LA that want to participate, it's all about the consumer packaged goods and the products and accessibility to those ingredients. And for Northern European food, you can have that at like a Whole Foods. For Chinese right. food, it's much harder. Right, um, right. Yeah, so Maji. So fantastic thing we're looking at here, yeah. Yeah, so Maji is, um, this is a picture of like the more artisanal market, but Maji is almost like, I don't even want to describe it as like a Whole Foods because it's not really franchised in that way, but it's almost like a Dean and DeLuca type yeah. market, but with a lot more going on. So maybe if you can go to the next slide. Before you move, yeah, okay, that's, that's yeah. good. Um, I just want to point out one of the things that I love so much is you'll see that the sort of, um, what do they use it? I, I don't know what they use it for. It's like the screens or whatever that they love. The tarp. Yeah, the tarp, exactly. They've taken that from, it's like these, uh, you know, the bags that people carry around, schlep their stuff around in these plastic striped bags, but it's turned into this kind of very cool looking thing here, you know, so it's part of the design. It's, it's yeah. Just yeah, and I think that in Taiwan, like the youth in Taiwan right now are like interested in, and Ozzy can speak to this more than me, but from my experience, there's like a, a lot of people are just like amazingly well-versed in art and design and experience and hospitality. And they're creating these like new forms of that, that to me feel like specifically Taiwanese, also like culinarily Chinese, but it's so regional, like that tarp I think is everywhere, but there's like some market bags, for example, that are like very Taiwanese that are used in all of the kind of like, you know, hip medicine shops and things like yeah. that. Yes, so, yes, yes, right. Yeah, so Maji, so this is a picture that I took when I was there. So Maji is essentially like an emporium of like organic made in Taiwan, uh, locally produced, small batch artisanal farmed food. So I don't know if you can see what the packaging says, but this, the middle shelf there says like grains of Taiwan. So it's all like heirloom rices, oh. heirloom grains, like everything just is not something that you can necessarily buy as like a large commodity, potentially because the production and the farming, like Taiwan is pretty small, right? So like some of these plots are very small as well. Ozzy's brewery is pretty small. So it's never going to be like that mass uh, production level. And the right. interest isn't to do that. But Maji is one of several stores. So Maji Food and Deli, Pico, News and Market. And there's like many, many countless smaller stores that are buying from these brands at wholesale mm -hmm. prices and then reselling them as retail uh, at retail and creating an experience. You know, not Italy, it's not as flashy as Italy, but it has that same like breadth, right. in my opinion. Right. And it's a sense of pride of place, right? Um, that you also saw in, for example, you know, the woman in Yunnan who's doing the farm to table restaurant and this, you know, places that many years ago, at least in, in you know, in Yunnan, Sichuan, they might've been considered, you know, quote unquote, backward or Luo you know, very, very backward and poor, but now there's a kind of a new sense of pride in that. And it looks like this is absolutely flourishing in Taiwan, the sense of pride in um, local, local production. Yeah, I think people are really excited about local production. Um, I, uh, when I go to Taiwan, I wish I was local, but I'm always like a tourist too. Uh, but I will say that like, because you kind of talked about it being like fancy for tourists or whatever, but this is, not for Western tourists. This okay. is for people in Taiwan, but also people coming from Singapore, Japan, Korea, and all over Asia, because Taiwan is so famed and well-loved for their food products. It's just like the US is just kind of like late to that understanding of Taiwan. Thing, Lisa, and you talked a little bit before when we were chatting about the Taiwan wave, just that in across Asia, Taiwan has this reputation for just having a lot of really cool stuff, yeah? Yeah, so like Taiwanese wave is sort of the term for this sort of cultural wave coming out of Taiwan, but it's like essentially, I think, and again, I'm not like a culture historian, so like I don't want necessarily want to be quoted on this specifically, but like for a long time, like Taiwan was looking at Japanese culture and Korean culture and American culture and Chinese culture, but now it's kind of been long enough that they're creating like new film movements and have like a lot of independent bands and music there that are influencing like 
you know, young Japanese creatives and Korean creatives as well. So it's just this like wonderful, like mix of, um, it's not so much that like, yeah, people are only looking to Taiwan and not Japan or Korea anymore. But like, I definitely think recently Taiwan has like developed a really strong kind of generational voice that is like a mix of like all of the migration and culture and <laughs> everything that's happening there. And that's mm -hmm. happening in food as well. So mm -hmm. for example, I sell a Malaysian, maybe the next slide actually is the farmer, I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, so I sell a, a Neonia sauce. So Neonia is like, um, uh, I guess like, it's, it's like a Malaysian a style of cooking that's yeah. related to like the Chinese diaspora. It's definitely like Malaysian though. Um, but anyway, the woman that I buy from, her husband is from Malaysia, so the recipe is his. Her family is a garlic farming family and the chili sauce is like a garlic chili vinegar sauce. So all of the garlic that they use is from her farm. But the recipe is, you know, is not a Taiwanese recipe. Of course, it's very popular in Taiwan because mm -hmm. there's a huge mix of food that people are interested in. Um, but to me, it feels very Taiwanese because you know, that mix and that innovation is like a really important part. Taiwanese food is always changing. Not to say that, that China's isn't, but I think like from a product point of view, it's, there's like always new products, always like cool, tiny little small businesses, like even new form factors of food. So it's very exciting. Right, okay, let's keep going through these slides. Um, okay, great. There's your little team. And there is that Ozzy in that picture or is that somebody else? That's his brother. Oh, his brother. Okay. Byron. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, yeah. Let's so, yep. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I'm, I, I haven't traveled to Taiwan in a long time, but um, basically, yeah, I've been visiting and um, like went to their brewery and met them. And I think one takeaway, and I'll be quick about this, is just that not everyone in Taiwan wants to sell. Yeah almost nobody does want to sell to just someone who's like, well, hey, what's up? I want to buy a ton of products. So Ozzy and Byron were really, really nice and wonderful. But like, I think there was a vetting pro process. I actually haven't talked to them about this, maybe not, but there's a vetting process on both sides where it's like, well, we're serving our local market. Our capacity is limited. Uh -huh. Our production is limited. So why would we open up this new channel? You know, and that's pretty uh -huh. different to my experience, like working in the US so you or had China. To pass the test. Yeah, I think so. I had this like spread in Taipei Times. Um, and, you know, it's instead it's been easier for me to like bring on new vendors and new products. So. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Cool. Very cool. Okay. So, Ozzy, let's go back to learn a little bit more about soy sauce. <laughs> it's right. so great, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. So, Ozzy, um, you know, are you, I, so I understand you're trying to add new flavors to your soy sauce also. Yeah. Um, since we, uh, on the third generation back and because uh, making soy sauce is like uh, you make every it's like uh, three three hundred sixty five days all 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 the all the same things so sometimes it, it could be really boring so um my brother and I start to sing why don't we put a little bit fun in there so um. Since 2015, we start to add the pineapple inside. So just 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 try out to see if the new flavor comes out. Okay. And just showing it to us. Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. This one. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> and this one, it came out really, really, uh, really nice feedback. So a lot okay. of uh, customer they start to give us feedback how they use this one, how how the flavor it is, how it developed the, 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 the dishes. And they, it, it, they, they give me a, a lot of um, encourage. So we, 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 we will start to make the, the another one as well. So the second one we made with the mulberries. And at the beginning, people, they don't know what the flavor it is. So we would have really uh, rough sell on that one. But after that, um, when people start to use it, they know how, how the flavor it is. And okay. um, yeah, it, we, 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 we start to sell the, the, the fruit flavor, so it's so really good. So what would you recommend? Like, what should I cook with pineapple soy sauce? Actually, first, let, oh. me, just, let me just tell pe people that we'd love to take questions in a few minutes. So if you have any questions, just type them into the Q&A box. I see. A few people have typed things, but mostly they're just saying, 
how much they love you guys. Um, they're saying they love you, Ding Xing, and whatever. But if you have questions, type type some questions, and we'll take some questions. Um, sure. But yeah, so what should we cook with pineapple soy sauce? Um, usually, you can go with the uh, chicken or, or protein. A vegetarian is also nice. So um, we in Taiwan, we also have a pineapple pineapple fermented pineapple chicken soup. So okay. it's also yes. really nice to add it in the soup to add, add other flavors. Okay, yeah. all right. Huh. Right now, every single year, we will produce one flavors um, just for limited additions. Just one, to see. One, one new flavor every year. So yeah, you, a new flavor. So what I love is that you and your brother, is three generations, right? But you and your brother yeah. are bringing new modern, modern, uh, ideas to your yes. company. Right. So can you, um, Ozzy, can you show us a little bit, take us, walk us around and show us uh, how you make it. Maybe we can see the urns okay. and see how sure. it's made. Okay. So this is the, mm -hmm. this one with the mulberries. Okay. This one is already become, um, uh, this one is already, uh, um, this is last bottle, so we okay. cannot sell it. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then that right now I'll take you to the. Uh... Okay, we're walking around. We're gonna see. I see yeah. something. Hopefully, the Wi-Fi will continue working. So we use the real wood to, uh, wood fire. Okay. And this is the. Uh, the traditional stove that you see, can you see it? Yes, 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 yep. Yeah, because in because right now we are in the factory, so it sometimes it could be a bit loud. Okay, that's alright. It's fine. Um, we can hear. This is the we are right now. We are uh, was fine. So okay. this is my brother. Uh, he's that's, stirring that's, the pots right now. Okay, that's your brother, right? Yeah. Okay, cool, great. So this what is like the pasteurization step, by the way. So it's sort okay. of starting at the back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, uh, th this is almost the, the end of the process. Okay. okay. So what, after we uh, finish the, 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 the here, we will felt it and we will squeeze. So that the, the, all the juice will comes out like okay. this. Okay. So it gets pressed, right? Basically yeah, pressed. pressed. Yeah, okay. And right uh, now this, for this machine is at the beginning of the process. After we saw the fermented black bean, we were, uh, we were cook it in this, we were cooking in this machine and then by stirring and also uh, using the temperature and also the, the pressure and the heat to, uh, to, to cook the black soybeans. Okay. So right now we are uh, simmering. Okay. Now is this, is this very different from a kind of a big factory production? Yeah, because it's in the big company, yeah. Uh, yeah. all the process is right now is made with machine now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so later on we will put the cook black bean in uh, on the top of this black uh, bamboo basket. Basket, yeah. Yeah, so we will cool it down and then we mix the koji inside and then we'll put in the uh, greenhouse, the room that we ferment our black beans. Okay, so explain to us what is koji? Um, koji is a, actually a bacteria that helps, uh, black, uh, helps the uh, break down the protein in in the black bean, so they'll okay. break down into amino acids. Yeah. So that is the flavor comes from the umami flavor. So this is the uh, the, the 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 rack that we later on we will put it in the um in in the in the the for the black beans, and then okay. we will firm it for two or three days at least. Two uh, at least three days. 
but for the for the winter time it takes longer okay and that's basically to are, get the koji to bloom before they put it into yeah. the terracotta that's yes I, and right now we are going to the uh, we will call wong chang but Uh oh, oh, we're frozen. Hopefully, he's going to come back. Terracotta. Yeah. So you're going to take us to see the terracotta. Can you see now? Yeah. No, your your video is frozen. I can hear you. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, okay. I can, can hear you. Can you hear now? Uh, okay. Can you see now? No, we can hear you, but the screen, the video is frozen. But that's okay. So, so we're talking about we're looking. I mean, I guess you're going to show us the terracotta urns, right? The pots. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And how long do you leave the soybeans in the terracotta pot? Not soybeans. It's not soybeans. Is it soybeans? So usually we will put it's uh, it's black soybeans. So. Um, usually you will see, oh, yeah, usually at least we will put uh, uh, black soybean uh, in the terracotta at least six months. Okay. But usually we will, we will, we will last long for at least eight months to 10 months. Can you see okay. the picture now? No, but that's okay. You just keep talking. It's fine. Um, I'm going to okay. jump in. So uh, we also have yeah. the... Uh, Go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, we also have different, uh, because we have different. Uh oh, I think you're going to have to go uh, back. Black back soy and beans uh, yeah. after we open. Right. We can't, so, Ozzy, we can't hear you. So, so, maybe it's better for you to go back inside. But I do have, I want to ask you a question, All right. which is a question, a question from the audience, which is, what do you look for when you are trying to see, is it a good soy sauce or a bad soy sauce? What, how, what do you look for? Maybe you can help jump in, Lisa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think good soy sauce versus bad soy sauce. I don't know what Odyssey would say, but for me, it's like not a great distinction because you always need kind of a cheap, staple soy sauce. So okay. it's almost like it's kind of the same thing that you would look for in like an oil or a vinegar or a wine. So a good soy sauce to me is like very much distinguished by its aroma. And um, yeah, Mara may also be able to to speak to this with the yuan soy sauce, but you know, like people describe natural wines as being like barnyardy. I definitely think good soy sauce also has that barnyardy fermented kind of funk. Um, the colors are, are very different. And I guess it's just that uh, the, the, yeah, it's hard to say like what's good versus what's bad. But I think that like, when you're looking at something that's like handcrafted, the product is almost completely different and you would use okay. it differently. So you would use it with like a lot more care. You would, you know, maybe think about where you're using it versus like making like a big pot of stew with it. Um, one thing that Ozzy has told me is that they use something called, a, it's called, I don't know in Chinese, but it's the hanging cup method. So when they look at their soy sauce to see like how you know, quote unquote, good it is, they actually pour it out of a cup hanging in the air and look at the viscosity and the texture wow. and the color. And so they use wow. that to kind of like understand, but you, I typed this in the chat because Ozzy can't show it, but we did make a 15 minute, like, you know, pretty high production value documentary just focused on their family called Time Terroir Taiwan. And really it's like all about, you know, how they make it, how they judge it. And like one thing that's just like amazing to me is they like, take the spoon and they crack the top on the, you know, top of the urn, scoop out the soy sauce, like bring it right up to their nose. And they're just talking, but it's like, oh, it smells like honey or it's like spring water gushing out. And so there's these like very beautiful, like poetic descriptors oh. that they use to talk about the soy sauce. So yeah, really, so really beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. Um, so another question is what's the difference in black versus regular soybean? And how does it make the soy sauce taste different? So you use yeah. black beans, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can also, I don't want to talk too much, but I can take that. So black, so most soy sauces, commercial soy sauces on the market now are made with yellow soybeans and wheat. Taiwanese soy sauces, the traditional ones are made with black soybeans and no wheat. So the difference is that a black soybean has actually a higher protein content. So the fermentation breaks down into like a higher glutamate content. So glutamate being like the same G as an MSG. So more umami content essentially. Um, but the taste is just quite different. And, you know, when people, it's hard to describe those differences, like without <laughs> having it in front of me and saying like, here, try this, but it creates a very, very nostalgic kind of, uh, I don't want to say old fashioned, but the Chinese translation is like ancient taste or old fashioned taste that does like a lot of people say, oh, this reminds me of my childhood in Taiwan. Right. And, um, Huh, interesting. Yeah, so I want um, Mara and Lisa, if you can type, there are a bunch of people are asking how to get this stuff, right? So um, somebody's asking about the um, the Hong Kong soy sauce, Yuan's soy sauce. So I don't know if it's possible to get it somehow or other here in the States. I actually don't know if it's available in the US. I know that it's for sale in Hong Kong only. Right. Okay. Um, I, can, I can look into that and let you know. Okay, great. And and uh, Yu Ding Sting, uh, yeah. if somebody could actually, maybe Ozzy or somebody could put in both English and in Chinese the name Yu Ding Sting into the chat because okay. people want to, they want to buy it. They want to yeah, find, they want it. find it. And sure. so and they can buy it from, buy it from uh, your company, Lisa, right? Yeah. Yeah. We sell it. We're the, I'm happy to say we're the exclusive distributor of Yu Ding Xing sure. right now, although I do not intend this to be an advertisement, but you can buy it at yunhai.shop, but we also have some retailers. So Milu Restaurant, uh, which is a new uh, and wonderful kind of like casual Chinese restaurant that opened um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and in, New York, in Manhattan, and then Rose Bakery at Dover Street Market, they carry it. Um, so you can go there if you want to get it in person. And we're actually opening a store in the fall in Brooklyn. So interesting, terrific. Yeah. And also, Milu, the restaurant you mentioned, they I know are making their own hoisin sauce. So they definitely fit into this story of the kind of, you know, the intro, the fascination um, with ingredients and sort of. Um, uh, yeah, the origin story of the food, you know, so that it's very, very interesting. Um, and uh, Ozzy, another question for you. I'm curious about, you know, do you feel like young people in Taiwan are especially interested in kind of going back to traditions, going back to their grandparents' traditions, that kind of thing? Um, I think for... Uh, for the recent environment circumstances, uh, a lot of young people come back to the to come back to the to their own town to 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 make a new career, because um, right now Taiwan we we are facing a really uh, the, the the really bad situation. The pandemic is uh, is it's like um, we 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 are trying to 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 make everything to. All, all the restaurants start to sell like uh like uh the, the lunch box or dinner box to 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 stay alive so, yeah. uh, so I, I would say some people come back for a new um business so i, I think it's good for the country for, for for us as well so we will have more people to join us and then to maybe to start a new activities yeah 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 and are you going to start after the pandemic are you going to start your um dinner series again the um uh yeah. what's it called the future dining future. Table. yes yeah um we start the future dining table in 2017 and um, we're we, we holding the events once a month and we will gather all the local produce and then we will, uh, make, we will make the dishes on the table. We will also decorate and then celebrate the local uh, produce. And then, um, but during the activity, we also will let all the customer and, uh, and, and the farmer to, uh, to talk to talk yeah. to each other, to, 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 I, I would say future dining people is a bridge to reconnect uh, the producers and the, and the farmers That's and, and so, uh, the yeah. customers, sorry. 
it's so fantastic and it's so interesting because this is a trend that we definitely see in America as well as you know we in the states also especially the younger generation are very interested in kind of connecting to roots and going back to the countryside and that kind of thing and you know art, the artisanal movement and it seems yeah. like uh you know we're seeing a similar thing in mainland china and in taiwan it's just so interesting and um i think maybe it's you know i wonder if it's connected to modernization right in modernization we lose something you know we live in the cities and we lose something we lose our connections yeah and um i would say right now in in taiwan since 2019 because the government realized the 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 the, the all, all the countryside is the 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 older people is um we, we don't have too much younger people in in the in the countryside so we will have uh, some policy to encourage pe young people to come back to their own town and to start a new 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 stuff i i think i think that it's really benefit uh, for uh for for the for the for the for a small town that that would um I, I would say it, it, it's 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 better for for us to to have a, a more uh, I was I, I think I need a little bit of translation yeah yeah um, that's I, I would say the uh, variety of life I would say yeah it's for German but it's German is what is it is what is it is what is it is 在我们就是在小在我们这个小镇，因为原本都是一些比较年长的人，但是后来因为呃政府的政策鼓励，那我们更多年轻人回来之后，因为大家大家会的能力不太一样，所以可能到可能回来之后，我们小镇就会有更多
tell a really wonderful story. So we're very grateful. Um, join us again next week, everybody, for the next episode of, of um, the Food and Ideas Festival, which is going to be a great conversation between um, the Shy Boys, which is Lucas Sin and Eric Z, who are going to be talking about global influences on Chinese cuisine in both Hong Kong and in Taiwan. And it's going to be a very, very interesting, fun conversation. So, um, Ozzy, we hope to come visit you in Taiwan sometime. Sure. And I uh, can't wait to taste your soy sauce. And Very welcome to come, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.